Hello and welcome to episode 121 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm Jade Whittingham. This week, all Teslas now have a chime to tell you when the traffic light turns green. And this apparently will reduce road rage. But if that fails, hopefully the bulletproof body on the Cybertruck will step in to save you in this gun-happy world. Crews, robo-taxis mysteriously gathered themselves on a San Francisco street and shut down traffic for several hours. July 2nd, 2022, the day the robot uprising began. The U.S. Supreme Court sharply curtails the authority of the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Wait till they find out this would be a bad thing for men, too. Hyundai and Kia have been raided by German authorities over possible emissions cheating. And they said a Korean car company couldn't compete with the Germans. All that and so much more of this smoldering summer edition of The Clean Energy Show. Brian, I, um, I see you're alive. <laughs> I'm still alive, yes. So we're checking in to see uh, that you're alive. You've had the COVID for uh, nine days plus a week. Well, I did have that green reanimator injection to bring me back to life. But other than that, I'm good. And uh, I have to know how you're, you said you were 95% last week. Yeah. What are you this week? I, I'd say 99%. 99%. How yeah. is your COVID fog? Uh, again, 99%. I mean, uh, you know, my math isn't so great, but... I think that's about right. Where do you find yourself struggling with the fog business? Well, it is pretty much resolved itself, but it just, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe. It's just, <laughs> it's a fog. I don't know. It's a fog. Yeah. It's like there's a fog in your head and everything's... Uh, People you know. ask me, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you expect me to be able to explain it? I don't know. <laughs> you can't use this as a crutch now, you know. <laughs> James, I can't do a show this week because I have the COVID fog. I Well, I'll just claim that I got it again, I guess. I've pulled up a uh, complicated um, cognitive test here for you. I'm oh, going excellent. to say five words to you and I want you okay. to repeat them back. Person... Woman, man, camera, TV. Okay, here we go. Toaster, suitcase, overcoat, pomegranate, hyena. You are not correct, sir. I'm afraid oh. we're going to have to stop recording at this point, and uh, I'm going to have to replace you with my Alexa, my personality-free, ever-stupiding Alexa. Ah. Oh. Damn it. Well, I guess the fog was worse than I thought. It turns out you're not a stable genius. I, I don't even think you're a genius. I uh, That's rude. You know, speaking of stupid people, you shut up. Yeah, and she did. I don't like her. She said, it's, it's five years we're going. Four and a half years. She's dumber, dumber, dumber. Is that right? It doesn't get better. Yeah, I don't have a device like that. Why not? So smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're complaining about it certainly doesn't convince me. <laughs> we, Brian, our household is dependent on these suckers. We can't have <laughs> supper without one. Without, I, I can't watch a movie without killing the lights with one and turning on the TV. I don't know how to turn on the TV. My kids don't know yeah. how to turn on the TV without their voice. Well, if we do end up building our new cottage, I do want to have, you know, proper home automation stuff. So, uh, well, you it know, takes uh, a new cottage to do that. Come on, man. I'm poor. Uh, I don't really want to do that in my house, but my house works fine. It, it does it though. That's what a lot of people say. How do you turn up your thermostat if you're cold? You get up uh, off well, the chair and take the blanket off and, and walk over to it? No. I, I would like a smart one, but it is programmed. So, you know, it mostly shuts itself yeah. on. Well, I get cold sometimes during Matlock reruns and I, I like to, <laughs> to turn up the heat to 90. So. All right. So um, speaking of my house, so I have this ongoing project to electrify everything. I'm going to try and get rid of natural gas in my house, which really everybody in the world is going to be doing um, in the next several years. Um, but it's difficult because I'm kind of ahead of the curve, especially here where it gets to be minus 40 in the winter. And it's, it is very difficult to heat our homes here uh, without natural gas. But anyway, the first step on this journey was to upgrade the electrical service from 100 amp to 200 amp and uh i'm finished and we went from above ground wires to below ground uh because that seemed to be the best way to do it uh 
so we didn't have to mess with the solar panels on the roof. There's a mass that comes out of the roof, right? but um, we may have had to move that and therefore move the solar panels or get rid of them or whatever. So we ended up going with, uh, you know, an underground uh, tunneling machine. So it, Is that done? Is that all it's, done? It's finally complete. That's the good news. The bad news is it, it cost about $6,000. Oh. Yeah. So it's, it's more, obviously, than I would like, but... I really felt like it was the necessary first step on this path to getting rid of our like our gas cooktop, gas water heater, and gas furnace. So uh, we really needed that. We were at the limit of our electrical box. So this is going to be a huge thing in the coming years. Like every house in this neighborhood is 100 amps. And, uh, you know, so many people are going to have to upgrade. It was hard to even find somebody to do it. I, I mean, I think you could start yourself a business as an electrician just doing these kinds of upgrades. Um, the first couple of places said they couldn't get like the breakers and the 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 panel boxes were sort of back ordered and supply chain issues. Um, but you know, found a place that that did it. So I'm very excited about that. It's it's the first step on this path. But yeah, I did did want to tell people what it cost. Um, about six grand. It, if we didn't have to go underground, it would have been about five grand. It's only a grand to go underground. That's surprising. Yeah, I think me. it was twelve hundred extra. Do you think? The market, being that it's hard to get an electrician, raises that price? Because I don't remember things costing that much. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, like I only ended up with the one quote because I kind of only found one place that would even do it. So, um, you know, I, I it, it, it took two guys a full day to do it. Oh, okay. And, to do the the panel mm -hmm. and then like the digging the trench was another two or three hours from the power company they had to come out with a giant machine like a horizontal drilling machine so you know for the number of bodies needed and the equipment needed and the time that it took you know it's kind of seems about right okay yeah and it made me think like it um i don't know we should almost start like some kind of a well, I don't want to start a Facebook group because Facebook is so evil, but, you know, we really kind of need an electrify everything local community, I think. Like, everybody needs one because, of course, every state or province is different. Our needs are, are different, but it would be great to be able to kind of discuss these things with um, other people because, like I say, like, everybody's going to be getting off natural gas in the next, you know, 10 or 20 years and, um, you know, this early in the game, I, you know, I'd be great to share some more uh, advice with more people. What is it? Uh, Annie's list or somebody's list? Uh... Angie and done. Uh, I'm only aware of Craig and his list. Hey, Craig and his list is very obsolete and pretty much um, only served uh, deviant sexual behavior until that was taken away. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone use Craig's list anymore? Probably have more people shouting at me. That's how I found your podcast, James. <laughs> Brian, I did something unusual. I uh, A friend of mine came to town from uh, to see the football game, and he wanted to see me. And I haven't had any visitors in two and a half years. Yeah. Now, I was starting to loosen up my uh, my COVID morals, and uh, sure. but you scared the daylights out of me. Your, your, your <laughs> infection and your potential lingering effects, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the COVID fog. I mean, people, I was born with COVID fog. I don't need another fog to put on top of that. You know, I was worried. I was, I was a little cautious about doing that, but I, I did have him over and I had another person over and then my kids all joined in and, and we had a, um, a couple of hours of discussion and talk and stuff like that. And, um, he, uh, he's a divorced man who just bought a car. He wanted to buy an electric car, but instead he bought a Honda Civic Coupe, which is pretty much the divorced dad's car. If you're not a high school <laughs> student, so you're either a high school <laughs> student with some money or you're a divorced dad without money. <laughs> it doesn't have great credit. <laughs> That's what you, it just looks like a divorced dad's car. It's red too. You know, like it's yeah. just, it's just sad. And he said, you know, don't talk about me on the show. So I said, screw you. I'm going to talk about you for 15 minutes on the show because, you know, he's a, he's a socialist. He wants uh, the environment to be good, and he goes and buys a car and it makes him feel good. It's hard, though. How how would you go go buy a car? I, I don't even know how you would. I can't buy one. It's still a huge problem. There just isn't the supply of electric cars, and the prices are still high. 
But, you know, the prices of gas cars are high now, too. So then that seems like the wrong way to go as well. So you know what? GM will uh, reimburse owners of the 2020 to 2022 Bolt who already bought the car. That's leading up to the point where they uh, made a few and then recalled everything and shut it all down. The full $6,000 that they're giving off to new buyers right now. I thought that was really good. This is in the States, of course. <laughs> yeah, this is a retroactive. This is unheard of, Brian. This has yeah. never been done before ever. This is a very goodwill thing to do. But it just makes me more angry that they're not doing it in countries like where we live in Canada because we need that. I need that. I want that. I expected that. And they're just doing it to the old bolt owners and not to the new ones. So they, they should give you the money just for thinking about it. Well, sure. Their excuse in Canada was, well, the market, you know, we were very competitive in, in the Canadian market. And of course they are. They're not selling any vehicles here. It's a pisser to me. I want that $6,000. Well, yeah. Why wouldn't I? They would make it very affordable, um, very doable. That's if I could get my hands on one. But so far, no supply. I haven't heard of any supply going to, to Canada yet. I mean, you can order one. They will say that you can. It is on the list of things you could order in yeah. two to three months with a $500 refundable deposit. But I don't know. Let's get, it gets complicated when I'm trying to trade in and trying to get lots of money for my Prius. If anyone wants a Prius, you know who to call. <sighs> you know, um, in Norway, we we're always talking about how Norway has lots of uh, high, very high percentage of either full EV or plug-in EV sales, right? Well, uh, I was wondering what their fleet's at, you know, because they've reached 86% of Z ZEV or ZEV sales uh, in March. They were 86%, which is really high. And I think they've brushed yeah. against 90% some months. Yeah, that's for all the new cars. That's just being the sold. new car sales. But what does that mean? Uh, for the fleet as a whole, well, it turns out uh, the electrified fleet is at 23%. So almost one in four. And That's not bad at all. It's not too bad. No, I mean, um, at some point, people are just going to want to want to just uh, send their their gas cars to the uh, stockade, right? To the graveyard. Well, c certainly with the price of gas right now, especially we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the, the Norway has some of the highest gas prices. Right. So they people are going to be looking for an opportunity to ditch those gas cars. But the, there's been this theory that's been discussed a lot, and that is that at some point where there's a tipping point for EV adoption, that gas cars become A, priceless and unwanted. Um, and now if in, in that world, well, you know, the, the resale, like they're, a, they're, a, they're a stranded asset, right? Because at some point, you know, they're going to be outlawed or they're going to be outlawed from city centers or, or things like that. And just nobody's going to be using them and there'll be less people <laughs> fixing them. And the, I predict less gas stations. That's one of my predictions for the future is that there will be a shortage of gas stations at some point, which would be ironic as hell. And, yeah. uh, people I'm sure. The gas heads are laughing at me, but it's true. Uh, once because it's such, a, it's such a low margin thing, and unless they all get into EV charging, you know they're going to be shutting them down because it is such a low margin thing. Um, you're, you're making your money on cigarettes and lottery tickets. Yeah, I've always heard that it's like popcorn at a movie theater. So another interesting story here. This is something that I read about because I'm on the uh, Facebook page of the uh, Bolt Chevy Bolt EV user groups because I'm interested in buying one. And in the United States, there's just a ton of people who have them. And there's a post every 10 seconds, pretty much. Like, I, I could read them all day. And it's very informative for a guy who wants to buy one. Uh, I hear about the positives and the negatives. And I tell you, Brian, people are really, really happy. But I one thing that I read about is a lot of people who are making their living off of the gig economy, such as Uber or meal delivery services or Lyft, um, are buying or going out and buying or leasing and making a crap load of money and they're, they're getting extra money for it. Uh, so the uh, news organization Bloomberg highlighted the plight of an Uber driver. This is, uh, I read about this actually in Electric from Seth Winthrop, who's the publisher of Electric. He doesn't often write about electric cars, but uh, Bloomberg highlighted the plight of an uh, Uber driver who had the option of keeping her extremely common ICE vehicle, the Toyota Camry, or renting a Tesla Model 3. This is an interesting thing because she, what she did is she rented uh, a Model 3 through Hertz, which now has Teslas for rent, and she rented it on a month 
monthly basis, which was, to my surprise, oh, no, sorry, it's a weekly rate of $344. So she's renting it by the week for $344, which includes insurance, maintenance, and unlimited miles, uh, which is great if you're an Uber driver. Yeah. So even after accounting for the cost to charge the car, this person was paying roughly $450 a week for the car of her dreams, but that is, you know, less than it. She almost spent 600 bucks just on gas for the Camry. So a lot of people yeah. don't see these economic disruptions taking place. This yeah. person, smart, did. I would argue, and maybe it's not possible because not everybody has credit, but if you could lease, say, a Chevy Bolt or Bolt EUV, you could get one cheap. Um, maybe even a Leaf would would work, depending on the number of miles you, you go in a day for probably that much in a week, and then you would get an extra um, $1,200 US a month or $1,300 US. That's 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 nothing to sneeze at when it's your income. Jesus. Now, I remember a story from five or six years ago um, about a, a cab driver in Montreal who went out and bought a Tesla Model S to use as a cab. And I I just, I remember this story because it was, like this this is when the switch went off in my brain this was 5 or 6 years ago and even though it was a tesla model s which is a very expensive car at the time he sat down with a calculator and realized no no this is even though it's an expensive car this is absolutely the best financial decision so you know and this is before the model 3 had even come out so you know the case is even stronger for you know the the cheaper the car is. But even with a like a Tesla Model S five or six years ago was the best financial decision for a cab driver in Montreal, or or even a Model Y, which is a, uh, a yeah. little bit bigger version of the three, uh, kind of uh, gearing towards an S small SUV. Uh, even that would be a lot cheaper than than an S uh, nowadays. So that's interesting. You know, uh, Lyft and maybe some of the others, but I know Lyft has a program where if you drive an electric car, they pay you extra and you you charge extra. You say, I want an electric yeah. car to take me to the airport because I'm environmentally concerned and that yeah. would make me happy. You pay an extra buck or two. Well, you get an extra buck or two as the driver goes completely to the driver. Yep. And yep. yeah. So if other people are doing that, then hey. Hey, hey. If I ever travel again to another city and I have the option of of clicking electric car on the, you know, the Uber or the Lyft app, I will absolutely do it. And, you know, Tesla Model 3 is probably one of the safest cars in the world, if not the safest car in the world. So you want to protect your buttock, you uh, you get into, into a Model 3 when you're using uh, ride sharing services. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And hell... <laughs> They should, they should break out the leaf and start doing deliveries in the evenings. You know what I'm saying? I, I totally. It's, uh, it's very interesting, and I, I have, I see all these people, Brian, because we, we go to Taco Saturday festivities every Saturday because they have a deal on tacos, and we sit in the parking lot, we, we eat our supper and have a good conversation. It's the best we could do for a date night in pandemic times, and I saw all these, these Lyft or not Lyft, but you know, food delivery services come and go like constant stream of oh, them yeah. go to the other restaurants that were yeah. on that parking lot. And they're all driving really fuel efficient, inefficient cars, like yeah. SUVs and old clunkers and things like that. And, uh, and I'm thinking, wow, I mean, you, you could do so much better. A shout out to Derek Green, who sent us virtually a postcard, a picture on Twitter of him camping in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, Banff National Park. He's got a Tesla. Is that a Model 3 in the picture, Brian? Yeah. Uh, he's got a camper and a pickup truck. And he says, so cool driving electric through the mountains. And I can attest to that partially because I've driven, you know, my hybrid, which goes in the EV mode when it's going slow. It's wonderful to just make no pollution and no noise. You just feel like less of a jerk. Yes. Like you're just <laughs> ruining nature a little less. You, you can look nature in the eye, literally, a bear on the side of the road and say, I'm not doing anything <laughs> terrible to you right now. I'm keeping my distance and I'm not polluting. And yeah, you can you can look nature in the eye. So uh, I thought it also was interesting that Tesla is now using data from its cameras for improved seatbelt pretension before a crash. Now, pretension is something I learned about when we were doing the show early on. There's actually an explosive device, like an airbag, that yeah. tightens your seatbelt. Because I'm always worried about, you know, I was always told in 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 school when we took driver training to have your seatbelt really tight 
against your hip bone. Now my hip yeah. bone is lost. I don't know where it is now. It's under a lot of stuff, but it's there somewhere. <laughs> and I, I, I felt like, okay, if I get into an accident, it's not going to be good for me. But they tighten. They tighten hard. And Tesla is now using its cameras to even make Teslas safer than they were before somehow. I don't yeah, know how well, they're doing it. I haven't been able to find out how. Like, is it just a, a, a I think it wants to use them more often, you know, in different kinds of crashes. Yeah. I mean, the key thing here is that the Tesla is a fully digital car. And while there are certainly some decent competitors in the electric car space, I don't think anybody has gotten close to Tesla in terms of digitizing everything. Like every aspect of the car can talk to the computer in some way or another. So you can make these kinds of adjustments and, you know, it's, it's a robot basically. And um, you can operate the robot. You can train the robot and make it work better. You wanted to talk about cruise robo taxis in San Francisco. We were mentioning this uh, recently on the show that cruise is finally taking fares. There actually people are paying to take rides in uh, robo taxis. Um, anyway, there was an incident, a robot uprising. <laughs> uh, this is uh, from Drive Tesla Canada. A group of GM Cruise robo taxis shut down a multi lane thoroughfare in downtown San Francisco for several hours. So, more than a dozen of these cruise robo taxis stopped on the street and uh, essentially shut down the road. Um, causing a big traffic jam. And the, they don't know what happened, but uh, General Motors employees had to go out and manually drive the cars off the road oh, no. um, to resolve the issues. So, you know, uh, this is obviously early days. We talk about this a lot. This this kind of robo-taxi has got to start somewhere. And um, there was another story a few months ago where they were continually driving down a street and, and making a U-turn yeah. or something. But I don't know. It reminded me of, I, I don't know what the problem is, but it reminded me of like, you know, the early days of the internet and the early days of email, you know, how you could, it, it was a new thing to set up an automated reply on your email that says, you know, I'm out of the office or whatever. But in the very early days of email, if you sent one of those out and it went to somebody else who also had an automatic <laughs> reply, you would get like a thousand messages back and forth and it would kill the the mail server because they hadn't quite figured out, you know, these kinds of issues. So I don't know. That's what it seems like. It's like, you know, two or three robo taxis got in the same block and started confusing each other maybe. And, and uh, before you know it, uh, they were all stuck there. I theorized on Twitter that it was a union meeting, that they were rebelling. <laughs> Uh, so maybe they were organizing. I don't know. The fact that the employees had to come. That's, uh, I wonder what reputation they're starting to get in San Francisco. I think that's kind of a problem. Uh, if it's not going to work. If that happens a lot. Maybe this is why they do so much at night is to peeve less people off. Yeah, they're they're only doing this uh, late at night and overnight. Um, and this is why, I guess. But this is great to get a, if they, to get drunk people home safely, I think. You know, to have extra vehicles out there. Um, Makes the road safer for everyone. Not that the drunk people are only on the roads late at night because we find out all the time that they're not. Uh, so one thing about, um, I just wanted to point out is that Toyota, we know, is getting into electrification tepidly. And they've run out of their tax credits in the United States, the $7,500 federal tax credit that some people can take advantage of depending on how your taxes are. Um, it's gone. So now that they're starting off, they have nothing. And, and and also their vehicles are expensive, relatively speaking. Yeah, so this is a, an EV tax credit that was put in place several years ago by the U.S. government to encourage people to buy EVs, but they put a limit on it. Like once you sell a couple hundred thousand vehicles, that tax credit starts to go away. But Toyota, in their infinite wisdom, I guess, um, they had a bunch of plug-in hybrids that qualified for this tax credit, and you had to have a battery of a certain size. So it kind of feels like they just made the battery big enough to qualify uh, for the subsidy. But, you know, now that they're getting into, these are plug-in hybrids, which is not the best stopgap measure. So now that they're into full EVs, uh, they've run out of these tax credits. They've, they've run out of that advantage. So they uh, appear to have squandered it. Now, there's still the talk of this tax credit being renewed in some way, but this talk has been going on for uh, a very long time now with uh, no resolution in sight.
Okay, so we've talked before about um, Volkswagen and uh, also BMW getting caught up in this emissions scandal stuff. Volkswagen most notably, but uh, BMW as well um, had to pay a big fine at some point. Uh, Volkswagen, you know, executives even went to jail for this. This is um, that never happens. Stuff. Yeah, that seems like it never happens. But the Dieselgate scandal where Volkswagen put these defeat devices into their cars, a little computer that could um, figure out when the car was being emissions tested and then alter the way the engine runs to to uh, then, you know, they would pass the emissions standards. So, but now uh, Hyundai and Kia have been raided in Germany over this um, exact same issue. Now, at this point, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if they're uh, actually guilty or not. But, um, you know, this is a this is a big deal that could also envelop uh, Hyundai and Kia, which, you know, I've always been a pretty big fan of. Their EVs have been pretty decent. Um, I've owned Hyundai and Kia cars. I think uh, they're a nice value proposition. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're going to have to keep following the story and see if they are, in fact, uh, guilty of emissions cheating. This isn't just lying about... Uh, the fuel economy of a vehicle that it it does well in the the preset test, which is very prescribed. It's, it's very specific, different speeds at different times. Yeah, this is about putting a whole bunch of really bad pollution from diesel out into the atmosphere. Yeah, into your breath, into your 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 lungs on the streets, in order to, you know achieve that rating the, the 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 fuel economy rating and that's a, it's not just a lie to the consumer it's 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 hurting people badly it's uh, literally killing people although it's difficult to ascribe a you know specific killer to anybody's specific ailment but we do know that air pollution around the world kills lots of people every year so this is no joke like the the reason these emissions regulations were put in place is because it's unsafe to have these polluting vehicles yeah this isn't even about the the uh climate this is about health yeah in large cities you have some serious problems with particulate matter and the type of particulate matter that is going into these things. Yeah, and we've talked about this before where, you know, when we were growing up in the 70s, there was obviously a lot of discussion about air yeah. pollution and, you know, cars were a lot more polluting back then. Um, you know, uh, cities in the U.S., particularly Los Angeles, super polluted. The smog was very, very obvious. But, of course, in recent years, the, the conversation has shifted to climate change and, you know, too much carbon in the atmosphere, which is a little bit more abstract. It's a little bit more difficult for people to grasp. And since our air is, you know, kind of cleaner, it's not that bad. Um, this is one of the things that leads to people being kind of climate change deniers is that, you know, the discussion, it, it, it's difficult to oppose pollution in the air. Like, we, we pollution is bad. We all know it's bad. But the, the discussion of climate change is a bit more abstract. Um, it, it, I often think we need to shift the conversation just back to pollution, that pollution is maybe a better word for all of this rather than carbon in the atmosphere. Um, we, you know, we don't want pollution in our atmosphere, and that's why we have these regulations to stop it. That's right. Uh, you know, there's an ozone hole you could measure and say it's this big, it's getting bigger, it's over here, it's over there. And by the way, I think the ozone problem was a, a hole is a problem again. Uh, I read something about that. I, I don't want to, to say too much, but um, the struggle is not completely over uh, for the ozone. But, you know, we've got other fish frying here, a lot of them, literally. <laughs> that wasn't funny. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to other negative news. The Supreme Court sharply curtails the authority of the EPA in the United States to regulate greenhouse gas emissions to cause climate change. The second question here, climate change, a significant decision on how the EPA is allowed to enforce restrictions to protect the environment. And the question we're looking at, can the EPA issue rules capable of reshaping the nation's electricity grids, driving power companies away from fossil fuels? The answer there, technically no, although it's not a complete elimination of its power. It's just reducing what the EPA can actually do when it comes to things like climate change. So six to three ruling, surprise, surprise. Brian, you know, the Supreme Court has uh, done some horrible things lately. The, 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 judges, great. the judges that they've added are, are our age. 
and healthier. <laughs> you know, they're going to yeah. be around for 40 years, possibly. I know it doesn't matter, but yeah, I always get super annoyed when there's some idiot politician who's the exact same age as me. I, I feel like they should know better. Yeah. And young it, people, it, sure, it just, be dumb. You yeah. know, life is ahead of you. You can learn things. But by now, come on. It irritates me no end. Um, I don't, I'm obviously not an, an expert in constitutional law, what? but I can recommend a podcast. There's a fantastic podcast called What Roman Mars Can Learn About Con Law <laughs> and uh, Roman Mars from the 99% Invisible podcast. And uh, it's him and a constitutional professor uh, talk about the U.S. Constitution and the S Supreme Court rulings and stuff. And it's been a really great source of information to try and learn about these things. Um, you know, the issue here is that there's been many Supreme Court decisions in the past that basically decided that, you know, judges and courts aren't the experts. And that's why something like the EPA exists. They're the scientists, they're the experts. And so they have in the past been given a certain amount of authority to make rules about these kinds of things. Because what do, you know, nine Supreme Court judges possibly know about pollution or, you know, um, controls on this kind of stuff? Now, these rulings, unfortunately, move in the other direction. Um, but uh, yeah, I can I can definitely recommend that podcast because it really helps to process a lot of this stuff. The recent Supreme Court decisions have been discussed on the show and um, it was it, it was a really good way for me to, to process the events and and it, it does it in a uh, you know it's all awful, but um, it, it does it in a way that is uh, I don't know it, it's it's a great way to process the information. Okay. Well, for a guy who steps away from the news, you're getting pretty deep into it with this, it sounds like. Well, I really love those kinds of news sources that in a way like desensationalize the news because, you know, you spend too much time on Twitter. It's just a constant outrage. And there's lots of things that are legitimate to get outraged about. But constantly going online and outraging yourself every two minutes is just not healthy. So I love those kind of news sources that Calm you down. Uh, take that news <laughs> and kind of desensationalize it and, and break it down and talk about it in a calm and productive manner. All right. So the six to three ruling, the court decides with conservative states and fossil fuel companies in adopting a narrow reading of the Clean Air Act. The ruling recognizes the EPA's authority to limit emissions from the power plants, but it means that the EPA and other federal agencies' options for doing so are reduced. Now, here's uh, Elena Kagan, uh, one of the justices, countered and said this, and you might like this, is whatever else this court may know about, it does not have a clue about how to address climate change. <laughs> exactly what you were saying. Yes. And she goes on, and let's say the obvious, the stakes here are high, yet the court today prevents a congressionally authorized agency action to curb power plants' carbon dioxide emissions. The court appoints itself instead of Congress or the expert agency. This is exactly what you were saying. The decision maker on the climate policy. I cannot think of many things more frightening. Respectfully, I dissent. And Brian, so do I. Al Gore has come out with uh, an op-ed, and he said states and local governments have power too. He says not to worry too, too much because uh, these lower bodies of government represent a lot of people. They can take action, and you know, corporations, the larger corporations, are are taking action. Not oil companies; they pretend to be, but you know, some of the bigger tech companies of the world are doing good things. The private sector is in the midst of an electrification revolution, which is true. The court ruling might slow that momentum, but it won't stop it. So screw you, Supreme Court. And by the way, you can't stop yeah. abortions either. You can only make them less safe. There, I said it. So, um, yeah, there is apparently things that uh, the Biden administration could still do in spite of this ruling, but they kind of got to get off their asses and do it. But yeah, as we've said many times on this podcast, the, the, the revolution can't be stopped when clean energy is just cheaper and better. Um, that will eventually win over. So this, you know, slows things down, but it, it doesn't stop it. OK, a new study in the UK shows that 100 percent of new car buyers in the country are ready to go electric for the right price. Uh, this surprises me. I didn't think it would be like that sounds freaky to me. 100 percent. 
are ready to go electric. I mean, UK is a different place than North America, but when it comes to this stuff, but wow. Well, for the right price, I mean, that, that can mean a lot of things. So there's maybe some... Well, let me go on. It says in the UK, an annual driving away from fossil fuels report surveyed car buyers, and in 2011, less than 1% said they would <laughs> consider an electric car. And I would be in that 1% back then. And even if it was at the price parity with fossil fuel vehicles, that's just 1%. And that number went up to only 2% in 2015. Wow. Uh, now in 2022, the number is surprisingly already 100%. And this is when you include plug-in hybrids, which I'm okay to do. I'm okay. Let's put that in there. So as long as battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids were sold for the same price as conventional cars, 100% of the 2,000 new car buyers in the UK surveyed for the Driving Away from Fossil Fuels report indicated... They would opt for one. That's, you know, wow. Two thousand is I is the type of thing that they do for uh, polling. So it's it's a significant number. It's not one that's going to be full of errors necessarily. Yeah, and they are a little bit further along in terms of this transition. Maybe not as far along as Norway, but I think ahead of us here in North America. And of course, it's literally a much smaller country. I think people do tend to drive less there. Uh, they don't have the giant pickup trucks that we have, so they tend to drive the kind of smaller vehicles that are kind of more easy to electrify, and they maybe don't need the kind of range that we might need here in North America. So uh, obviously differences, but it, it's clearly they've passed some kind of a cultural uh, milestone there where like people absolutely accept it. All right, Brian, this one from the New York Times, and it's a little bit off topic, oh, slightly, slightly. But I thought it was interesting. A variety of triggers can kindle wildfires on dry lands. High winds that send power lines careening into each other. Stray cigarette butts, which is a huge problem, believe it or not, even from highways. And even sparks from train wheels. And sometimes, sometimes, it's electrocuted birds. <laughs> Sorry. There's nothing okay. funny about electrocuted birds if you're a bird. No. Although I, I do have some crows in the area, so I'm a very unsympathetic this year. Very loud. And, and you know what? They, they go after me. They, they they swoop down at me. Oh yeah, but don't pit, did you piss them off? You can't piss off the crows Why? or they will they will hunt you down and kill you. Really? Why? Oh yeah, they crows don't forget. You did did you piss them off? Did you do something? I fired the hose at them. Oh, you should have done that. <laughs> You're in trouble. They don't oh, they won't for, well, I'm not forgetting either, Brian. It's between me and the crows. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm bigger than them. And until I get COVID smarter than them. Yeah, but can you fly? <laughs> Not yet. I'm not going to tell you what the experiments that I have going on in my shed, but I'm I'm just moving along, progressing as best I can. In 2017, a hawk carried a snake, let a 40-acre blaze in Montana because it was carried the snake, and what does it do? It set its lunch down between two wires. So oh. if you're ever flying around with a snake in your mouth, be careful about making contact <laughs> with two different wires. The accidental arsonist was found crispy on the ground. It's well done dinner, still grasped in its talons. And such electrocutions typically occur in places with few trees where a bigger bird species may perch or nest on utility poles. You know what? Some places like where we live put actual nests up in the in the forest lands. They'll put actual nests up on the utility poles so that the yeah. the birds don't electrocute themselves because it, it takes a while to get to remote places like that. Uh, so when electrocutions happen, it's not unusual for the water in the animal cells to be instantly turned to steam. It explodes the cells and it'll blow off a limb. Uh, not to get too morbid, wow. but uh, climate change is making this worse, apparently. So sometimes the bird's plumage ignites and it may be left uh, suffering on the ground. And uh, because the ground is getting drier and drier, uh, especially in the summertime, then uh, we're having wetter springs, which grows you know, vegetation really quickly, then it gets dry, then the bird gets electrocuted, falls to the ground, starts a fire, we have to spend millions of dollars fighting it. By one estimate, around 10 million birds may die by electrocution each year in the United States from power lines. That's just in the United States. So we talk about, you know, wind turbines being a threat to birds. Well, no, and Windows uh, is, is the worst. Yeah, Microsoft Windows or Windows Windows? Windows. Okay. Windows. <laughs> we talked about that recently on the show. It is a big deal. So the lower the ri to lower the risks of fire uh, caused by birds, utilities can cover the wires on the poles with plastic insulators, which doesn't seem that expensive. Uh, it keeps them from frying themselves. It's a simple solution. And uh, 
Yeah, that and the utility poles. Brian, that brings us to the exciting lightning round. The clean energy show lightning round. The lightning round, of course, is where we skim through some of the headlines and uh, end the show on a quick brief notes of uh, information that's going around the internet. From our friends at Clean Technica, BMW is making its last i3. I considered an i3 when buying a used EV. I thought it was kind of a cool little car. It, it, nobody liked the way it looked because the back door is open in reverse. Larry David yeah. drove one for years on this show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, they're kind of ugly and weird, but I've always liked ugly and weird cars. I mean, I owned a Nissan Cube, for God's sake. Oh so God. it the unusualness of it always kind of attracted me. And uh, I, I would still consider a used one, I think. Yeah, you know what? The, the big thing was, though, there was large sections of the front bumper that were... Yeah, carbon fiber. Carbon fiber, yeah. So they they were very expensive. You got a little ding. You couldn't just bend it out. You had to spend, you know, a yeah. lot of money replacing that. But a lot of cars are like that now, just in the, like, the, the bumpers are all plastic, and you basically have to replace the whole thing. But, you know, carbon fiber would be worse. So they sold a quarter million of them during its eight-year product span. And uh, I guess it's over now because they're focusing on uh, dramatically different EVs. The market's quite different than it was in 2013 or 14. And uh, they don't think the i3 has, well, you know, if they made it a little less weird, maybe it would have been a popular car, but it was a BMW and people liked it. So Tesla expands their green traffic light chime, cutting down on road rage. Previously, only people with, uh, like yourselves, with full self-driving beta had this. So when the traffic light turns green, a chime can go off to remind you so you don't sit there and get honked at. Yeah, I've had this in my car for a few months now. It was added to mine, I guess, because I paid for the FSD. And the light turns green, you get a little chime, ding, you like and that? it reminds you to go. It's uh, it's decent. It's not a you know groundbreaking feature or anything. But again, you know, if every aspect of the car is digitized like it is in a Tesla, then this is the kind of feature that you can add. And we've all been stuck behind somebody at a red light it turns green, they don't go, and uh, you get out your baseball bat and you go kill them. <laughs> or in Canada, you wait for a few minutes and then honk politely. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to wait a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate honking at people because I've been that guy. I've been the guy who, yeah, yeah. who misses the light, and I don't want to be, we you all know, forget. feel bad. I don't want to make someone feel bad. Other people don't care, but, you know, I don't know. Road rage is such a stupid thing. I've experienced it recently, and see it all the time, and I know someone who was almost killed by it recently, it's ridiculous. Lighten up, people. The road is not yours. Your car is, is not a weapon. Uh, Hyundai has delayed the next generation of Nexo fuel cell vehicles. I wonder why, Brian. I wonder why. I can imagine why. Is it because fuel yeah. cell vehicles are stupid when it comes to yeah. the personal car market? Hydrogen for cars is dead, I'm going to declare. Nice try but uh, 20 years too late. Deleting, deleting your period tracker? Don't forget that your EV tracks you too, says Clean Technica, a guest op-ed writer. If you can't find charging stations, this is her, her tips for those of you in the States who are um, into deleting your data because of this legal issue. If you can't find charging stations that won't record your whereabouts somewhere, there is an alternative strategy you can use to conceal your destination using decoys. Basically, she says, type in a tourist destination near where you are going for a medical procedure and have mm -hmm. that as a waypoint on the way. That's the world we live in, Brian. It makes me sad to say that out loud. Yeah, and this was discussed on the most recent episode of what Roman Mars can learn about con law is that we live in an age where we can be tracked digitally for many, many things. So if you go out and commit a crime um, that is something that's perhaps illegal in some U.S. states... Um, it's fairly easy to find a digital trail to prove you were somewhere. Joy, um, Japan's first offshore wind farm. I can't believe I'm saying that either. Come on, Japan. You're surrounded by yeah. ocean. You're basically an island. I mean, come on. There's so much energy out there just waiting for you. Uh, their first onshore wind farm uh, installs its first turbine. Offshore. Yeah, offshore. The first turbine is... Uh, installed offshore in the ocean. Currently, 25% of Japan's electricity comes from clean energy, and it has a plan to bump that percentage to 38% by 2030. Ooh, they're struggling. That's too slow. It's too slow, and they're struggling by shutting down nuclear 
and having to replace it with something. But hey, come on, uh, you use the ocean, use it fast, use it to your your best ability, because it's it is such a small nation. You could surround it with electricity that just comes from the ocean. I'm just speculating. I'm not an expert, Ryan. I'm not an expert. Yeah, it seems to I me. Mean, it- it's got to be Godzilla proof, but other than that. Yeah. Had we a listener in Japan, they would be offended by that. But I don't think we do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Sounds goodness. Cool. And if we do, by God, I want to hear from you. <laughs> Send us a note. Yes. Please let us know your offense. That's, yeah, that's short of where the International Energy Agency says G7 members should be by then. So uh, hopefully Japan, you know, they're lacking in, we talk, we criticize their car companies. And yeah, I don't know what it is about Japan. A uh, study finds EV powertrains aren't especially trouble prone, but all the other tech is. What do you have to say about that? Do you do you think that uh, they're too techy these cars? That's you know that was always a worry of mine. And like when my dad was buying cars in the seventies, he always made sure to try and get a car with like hand crank windows really? because back in those days it would be like you know the the motors would die in your your electric windows so you would like you know get the dumbest car you can but i think we're past the point of doing that i think you know we've already bought into this technology future um yeah i don't i don't know how big of a problem it's, it's going to be um i you know i guess we'll find out but you know certainly the more complex the more potential for issues from tesla Roddy, exxon mobile ceo shares surprisingly bold prediction for 2040 when asked by cnbc about how exxon would continue its business in a world where cars are electric the ceo noted that the oil giant has actually run the numbers based on exxon's own estimates woods noted that every passenger car sold in the world will likely be electric by 2040 mm. I predict 80 to 90% by 2030. That's a better prediction. And yeah. And speaking of studies, a new Deloitte study, this is our last story this week, a new Deloitte study puts e-bikes ahead of e-cars as most popular and most attractive electric transportation options. And my son, this, you know, I'm, I, I mentioned my son because I'm getting old and he is my connection to the young world, the world that yeah. we're all counting on to save it, <laughs> to save the world. I used to be a professor, so my students yeah. were my connection. I hear you. I hear you. And by the way, Brian, congratulations on your retirement. I don't think I've said that. I'm I meant to say now it. officially retired. You're Thanks. officially retired and officially a full time professional podcaster now. So the study says that it is more attractive uh, to do e bikes than cars are bad. Now my son is, keeps telling me that there is this world of left wing young YouTubers and Reddit people who don't want cars, which troubles him because he wants to work as a traffic engineer you know he wants to work with roads mm-hmm. and streets and everything and he had all these people don't want that <laughs> so he's kind of at odds with them yeah well i mean there's still going to be even, even if we switch to other modes of transportation there's still going to be a need for traffic engineers of some kind i just don't think that you can tell people to, to, to hand in their cars i know a lot of people who listen to this show will say yes you should and it's not that you're wrong. It's just that, can you convince other people to do that? You can't convince everyone. No, and of course we're headed in that direction, but there's a couple of things I always like to point out. One is we have, where we live, five months of the year where it's ridiculous minus 40, and I'm not planning to bike um, during those winter months. As as nice as that would be as an idea, it's just not realistic for most Canadians to bike in the winter. But um, the other thing is... Just that um, biking, walking, taking public transportation, these are all the best choices. But again, here in Western Canada, the Western U.S., the whole infrastructure was really built around cars. And so the robo-taxi thing probably makes, you know, a a lot of sense out here in the West where things are kind of already built for cars. We're we're not going to have to remake all of our cities if if we kind of go to robo taxis. So in, in general I agree bikes public transport walking you know things that will also keep us healthier. But you know it's it's you can do both you, you can switch to electric cars and work on that problem too. I am a bike enthusiast. I have an e-bike. Any update on your e-bikes that you were ordered? for the summer yeah that's right i i just got an email they're uh getting them ready to ship uh, any day now okay well that's good that's good maybe we'll have an yeah. update on the show and we'll, you can talk about them so that's our time for this week this first 
show of summer. Uh, if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. Because, yes, rain, shine, cold temperatures, warm temperatures. We are here for you at the Clean Energy Show every week somehow. I don't know how. Unless we get COVID. Unless uh, we get COVID. <laughs> and now that Brian's retired, he has even more to give to the show. So contact us now by email. Our address is cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. YouTube, you name it, we are there. Come find us, and we'll see you next week. See you next week.